Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, pioneers continue. There's always pioneers. There's pioneers in all shapes, size, creed, colour. And there's one pioneer. I've known Martin for a, a little while. You must be saying Martin. Yes, what type of Martin? Who is Martin? Martin, who you say? Well, let's find out who I'm interviewing today. Because, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome to the industry street, the one and only Mr. Martin Official J. <laughs> How you doing, sir? I'm good, man. I'm good. Can I call you Official J? No. Who is the Official J? I don't know. Not me. Maybe Jay-Z, but... No. <laughs> you know? Um... I'm just MJ, Pappy, MJ. Gramps now, um, or Martin. Well, Martin J, there is a couple of Martin J's. I know at least one other. Yep. Um, but the one I'm talking about is the one that's got the history of being the Soka King. The Soka King. But there's always a journey before you get to that stage. So first, I'd like to say, Mr. Martin J, this is all about your life. Martin J, I do believe, was born, am I right? Because I sometimes get this wrong. You're a North Londoner. Is that right? No. Nope. No? I'm always getting it wrong. <laughs> Talk to me. I was born in Paddington. Um, I'm a West London man. I grew up in West London. Um, I came to North London in the latter half of my life um, to live with my, my partner, who's my wife now. Um, but yeah. I was born in Paddington, grew up in Ealing and Acton, um, hence the reason why I'm a QPR supporter. <laughs> um, yeah, so originally... I was going to say you're on your own, but I'm going to leave that. <laughs> yeah, leave that. Leave <laughs> Otherwise, that. he ain't going to give me his story. But Martin, um, as a young boy, what type of upbringing? Because I know, you did, this is not just you, because I know your brother as well, and you can put to light as well who your brother is. Yeah, my brother Vinnie Ranks. Um, we grew up, our parents from the Caribbean, you know, my mum was born in St. Lucia, but she grew up in Dominica. Uh, my father was Dominican. Uh, we lost our dad at right, a very yeah. young age in so 1984. Um, and so I think that made the bond between myself and my brother that slightly bit stronger. Weren't you close? Because Vinny, Vinny's a different character, isn't he? We are very close and we were very close mm. but I think there's an additional closeness and you're right we're like chalk and cheese yeah, yeah, um, yeah. but there is a bond between us it's, 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 it's to put it into a perspective for you um, I can go weeks without seeing him mm. weeks and the moment that I feel something's wrong You'll call him. I'll call him. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And, and that's the kind of relationship we've got. I wouldn't say it was a father-son relationship, but I was very much the big brother. Well, you are the big brother. I am, yeah. You are. But is, I, it, is it just you two? Just us two, yeah. Okay. And of course, on top of that, now, the schooling. Were you a good boy? I like to ask you lot this. Were you a good boy or were you a little ragamuffin or a little bad boy? Or, come on, tell us the truth, Martin. Now, How did it start off? In school, I was, I was, up until a certain age, I was what they would class as a model student. Um, I think my dad dying when I was 13 gave, sent me a lot of confusion at the time. And also at that time in schooling, um, the teachers were going through this strike and all it would take is for one teacher to be off and they'd send you home for the day. Right, right. And so there was quite a disruptive period in our school life. Um, I was very much into cricket. I played um, for Old Etonians, my local club. I also played for London schools. I captain London schools and I played for Middlesex Colts. Uh, and I played a couple of games for the south of England. And so my, the period between 13 and 17 was very much about traveling around the country playing cricket. Um, in fact, the day that my dad died, I was on tour. I was down in Exeter with London wow. schools wow. and they had to put me on a train to Paddington station without telling me why I was going home. Mm. Um, and the day before I took my, I took, my best bowling figures for London schools, four for 63. I'll never forget, I'll never forget, you know, that period. Um, and so I started to kind of 
I wouldn't say be a bad boy, but I kind of started to lose interest in the whole academic system. Um, and I came out of there with very few grades, grades. you know. Um, and so I had to think about what I was going to do in my future. But then the music came into the... Uh, or was that something that you had as a hobby back in the day? Did you used to collect your vinyl, a little one here, a little one there, listen to it. You didn't realise you were going to get big on the scene with it. I mean, how did that come about? Again, when my father died, my cousin, who's um, eating sweetness from Satisfaction. Okay, see Family Affair. Yeah, me and him started buying records and it got to the point where he was buying the reggae stuff, I was buying the soul stuff. Um, that's how I met Daddy Ernie. I started buying from Daddy Ernie and Classic Record. Yeah. Um, and it was just something that we started to do as like a... At that time, everyone was into the sound system thing, you know what I mean? Mm. Uh, and we had formed our own one. I think the creation of the names was all the excitement, you know. We had the Sphinx Master Roadshow. Don't ask me what it meant, because I don't think we got a clue. Um, I was Crazy MD, he was Daddy Mayo. And um, whilst I was doing that, a lot of people were saying to me, Martin, you don't sound like a song man, you know. You sound like a radio man. See. I on radio, you know. And they kept saying it. And I just got to the point where I said, boy, Mark, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to explore this. And um, at that time, Time Radio, which was run by Mikey Coos. Mikey so. Coos, the good old Mikey Coos. Talking about Mikey Coos on that, before you go into that, Martin, uh, Mikey Coos is where I met Vinny, your brother. Yeah. Cause we used to be on Unique together. Correct. Okay, carry on, sorry. So Time Radio, Fresh FM, those, those kind of stations were the stations that I listened to when I was growing up. Um, and I wrote a letter to Mikey, because Mikey had this segment where you could come on and do a little, like, half hour. And just Like as, a giving up spot, basically. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And just as I was getting ready to go into Time Radio to do this slot, they got a, they got, they got a proper raid. And it was kind of like the end of Time Radio. And um, I didn't use that energy, because obviously by that time I'm buzzing now. I uh, went on a station, a new station called Pioneer Radio, um, which only lasted a few months. But I think it, in that time, I got my, my feet wet. Mikey called me and um, said, we're starting, we're starting WLR. I was like, what's WLR? He said, West London Radio. He said, I'm gonna done with the time thing. Just gonna start a new brand, WLR. I said, all right. I said, I want you to come on. I said, no problem. So I came on and I was doing a Saturday and a Sunday show where I was playing like Lovers Rock and Revival. Can I just interject there? Where you were talking about he started up the new station, were you worried that he could get another lick and this time it could be you on the air at the time? No. I, I, I think at that age you weren't worried about... I don't think you were worried about that. There was no... I wasn't even thinking, I wasn't even hearing about Choice FM or Kiss FM or, you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, that yeah, was our yeah. life at that time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the reason, the reason behind Time Radio as a brand, not being Time Radio, was not gonna frighten me, you know what I mean? So when Mikey said he was setting up WLR and there was enough radio DJs that were involved, Jockey J, Jenny Francis. Yes. You know yes, what I mean? Yes. Those kind of people were on that station. Gamo Speng, Natty B. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, it's only after a few months of being on WLR. And I, I, in a minute, I'll tell you how I started playing soca music. But it was after a few months of playing like the reggae and the soul music that Ernie said to me, next year is a big year. For you? Generally, he said, next year there's a radio station coming on there. Start to prepare for it. I say, all right. Back to WLR now. One weekend, Mikey called me. In fact, he called me in a week. He said, yo. I said, what well, one? He said, Smokey's going away. You've got to do his show. I said, well. Which everyone knew Smokey as Frog, Soka Calypso. Right. Zook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, I've got to do a two-hour Soka show. He said, yeah. I called my cousin Ian, I said, boy, I'm going to have to raid Auntie's records. <laughs> I put together this two hours. So you show. had no knowledge really on soccer? I knew, a, I knew a little bit, but not, 
enough to say you were a pioneer yeah you know what i mean if you were asking me about rare groove at that time and artists soul artists and that i could give you history mm. and all of that i was well versed in in what i was doing um so he said yeah you gotta do this show so i'd done the show for two weeks a week later i get a phone call from Smokey, and he's like crazy md i said yeah he's at the Smokey jar i said what happened he said, um, my brother was listening to when you did my show. So I'm waiting for it now. And I goes, yeah. He said, you sound he said you sound better than me. Wow. He said, you don't know what you're playing, but you sound, <laughs> you sound better than me. He said, come and see me. So uh, that time there, he had a shop. His brother had a shop, TJ Records in Clarence Road. Clever Clapton. Clapton. Yeah. yeah. I'm in Acton. I've left Acton. Gone to You were buzzing right now. Yeah, mm. proper. Mm. Gone to the shop and I've come out of this shop with a box of records. Wow. And that was the birth of my soca music soca collection. Mm. <clears throat> About two weeks later, Mikey rings me, said um Sonny Roberts, who owned Orbiton Records. Yes. Um we sadly lost him now, may he rest in peace. But Sonny Roberts, who was one solemn looking brother at any time and i got to know after a while that it was just his look mm. you know um he called mike and said um i'm gonna sponsor the soca <coughs> show <coughs> get crazy md down here so they put me on one hour every day of the week monday to friday i think it was called the soca express i went by sonny roberts now remember Smokey dealt with all the release stuff Sonny was who you went to for the imported stuff. So by now, your collection is growing. Within the space of a month, I've gone right. from nobody... To somebody. To somebody that had a proper collection. And I just said, Martin, if you don't utilise this to your benefit... It's a waste. Then you're a mug, mm -hmm. you know? Definitely. And presentation for me, up to this day, is still paramount. It's 100%. the most important thing. 100%. Um, and so I just started to create a brand for myself as Martin J, the Prince of Soka, which I am still today, the Prince of Soka. So you're not the king? I'll never be the king. I, I always Who is the king? I don't know. I don't care. I, I, <laughs> I just know that I wake up every morning as the prince. It's tattooed on my left arm. Mm. And it means that I can aspire to be somebody better somebody better mm. and, and 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 that's how i try and live it's not a ranking thing of any sort you know i just know that whatever i'm doing now tomorrow i want to be better at it. well you are better at it because along the way you actually carried on and through carrying on on wlr we've got to say that this big name that came up this radio stations happened to be the birth of choice of fan yeah tell us how that came about so Choice FM went on there March the 31st, 1990. And like I said, Ernie, I was very close to. Um, in their first six months, they didn't have a soca show. And Ernie just kept banging on at me, going, get in there, Mark, get in there. They ain't got a soca show. Nobody can do a soca show like you. Just keep, keep, keep sending in your demos. And I went through that period of sending in demos, sending in de demos, calling up managing director. Hello, Mr. Berry. Have you listened to my tape yet? No, not yet. And... Does that, do you know something, Mark? I'm so glad you've said that. Because I did the same thing with Kiss FM. Yeah. Doesn't it frustrate you that they can't pick Big up time. a phone and just... So yes or no? But when you're part of the radio station and you see how many demos come in, then you kind of have a little bit of understanding, you know? In Patrick's office, there's a cabinet. <clears throat> in them days, it was pure cassettes. Yes. You imagine, yeah, that one day I had to go through it for him. <laughs> and there was at least 500 in there. Wow. And then you kind of get to understand that there's just... Where Not do you start? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so I had to wait for an opening. And the opening came in the most bizarre way. I got a phone call from Patrick Berry. On my Motorola 8000 <laughs> 90s. Remember? Yeah. 90s. Yes, I do. The big brick. So there's no... I had a transportable up. before that. Right. <laughs> I, I didn't have one. Mikey had one of them. I didn't have one of them. I, and it was bloody heavy. <laughs> <laughs> of 
I used to, I used to say, oh, Mike, I don't know how you drive around with it, but <laughs> my one seemed small at the yeah, time. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. So the phone rings. They were called the brick phone. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Phone rings. Um, hello, can I speak to Martin J, please? Who's calling? That time there, I'm crazy MD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Who's calling? Is Martin J there? Yeah, but who's calling? I've got attitude. See, I've got now. attitude, yeah. He said, it's Patrick Berry from Choice of Phone. This is Martin J. How can I help you? <laughs> How you switch? <laughs> Patrick said to me, we need to talk to you. Um, Daily Mirror have agreed to sponsor Choice of Femme for the carnival. We need to put a carnival package together. I said, okay. Yeah. So were you in the carnival before this opened up the carnival for you? I was in, I was involved in the carnival purely from a heritage point of view. Do you know what I mean? I yeah. think when you're born into Caribbean families that are from... Your family the, dabbled into it, basically, yeah. with playing music down there with sound systems. Might have done a little stool or something like that. Is you, that what you, you mean? You've just been involved yes, in it, yes, you know yes, what I mean? Yes, 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 um, yes. yes. So I said to him, you know, what is it that you want? And when he came back to me and he said, we don't know. I said, all right. In 24 hours, I had put together a schedule of an interview that would happen in Daddy Ernie's show every day of the week. And I'd kind of programmed one soca song every three hours. I wasn't going to go in there and try and like, you know, overwhelm the radio station. Yeah. Yeah. But you want to do a carnival feature, you play a carnival song, you talk about the Daily Mirror. And Patrick was so impressed in the speed in which I did Your it. delivery. Um, and I went there with everything. I went there with the vinyl. I went there with everything printed out and photocopied. So Patrick said to me, how much do we owe you? I said, what? He said, how much do we owe you? I said, I don't want money. He goes, well, what do you want then? I said, Patrick, I've been sending you demo tapes for the last three months. I want to show. He goes, oh. He goes, I guess I better listen to one then. <laughs> and then he listened to one. And on Carnival Day itself, I was there, part of the outside broadcast that they did, just helping out where I could. Mm. And um, he then said to me, you've done really, really well. Let's get you trained up with a view to getting you on there. See, that was a very important part. Because of your training experience before, did you notice the difference between what you were taught and to what you were uh, um, before? In terms of... Your presentation skills. Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, I wasn't taught how to present. I learned how to present. Common sense? By, yeah, I pick, I, there was just certain radio presenters that I listened to and it was like irrespective of the music they were playing, it's how they presented. Drop names. David Rodigan for one, obviously. The way that he introduces a song, I love that, you mm. know what I mean? Mm. And Dennis Brown and Freddie McGregor, who I interviewed on Choice when Ernie went to Jamaica, Dennis Brown said, I'll never ever forget these words. He goes, why? We have a car, be a bit Rodigan, you know? And I said to him, why? He said, just the way you talk, mm. you know? So mm. that, was, that was a huge moment for me. David Rodigan, there was, a, there was a guy on Time Radio called Rapmaster MC. He used to do the drive time show. And the fact that he could play a Judy Boucher at quarter past five and play Rob Bass and Easy Rock at quarter to six, he, the kind of the, the variety the of music that he played um, taught me a lesson. And I learned from that. And, and I just learned from those kind of things and, and moved forward, you know. Um, when I got onto Choice and when I started to do Choice Breakfast was when I started to learn a few tricks. Well, talking choice. about that, because your journey did carry on, because Choice Breakfast, there was a show that was called on Choice that everybody woke up to in the morning and it was called Two Tons of Fun. Yeah. Two Tons of Fun which was with the, the untouchable, because come on, I mean, I'm a breakfast DJ with my partner, Mazzy, but at the end of the day, two tons of fun, you've got to look up to certain people, and you and Jeff Schumann managed to pull something off. How did that come about? We stumbled upon it, to be honest. Um, Angie was doing breakfast at the time, Angie Greaves. I was very close to Angie. I knew that she had itchy feet at the time. Um, 
I never for one moment thought that I was going to be the one that was going to be taking over from the breakfast show, from her breakfast show. Um, when she left, they had a few months of where they were trying things out and they just had this idea and they said, let's put Martin and Jeff together. And I think they felt that there was a balance between us. Um, we had known each other from West London um, prior to that. Not well, well, well. You never worked with each other, did you? No, but we knew of each other. We yeah. used to get our hair cut from the same guy. Yeah. Um, so Jeff's come over to Choice. He's done, he started his Saturday show. That's going well. He's got a certain style about him. And then they put us together. And the first three months was absolute hell. What was that, Mark? Because I think we were both on a mission. Competing against each other? I don't know if we were competing against each other, but we just weren't on the same page. Yes. And I remember one day, Jeff coming in to the building and going, look, you got to make money. I got to make money. We got to trust each other. And I said, I'm cool with that. And that morning just changed everything. The listeners, I don't think felt... I don't, I don't think they heard the frustration. The difference. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I think they noticed the difference once once we decided that we were a brotherhood. Yeah. They heard a difference because we just tackled everything differently. And that's where the name of Two did it come, of Fun did from. It, did it come from... Be honest with me, Martin. Even with yourself. Was it two egos together that was wondering if they could work together? Um... I don't think it was two egos. I don't think it was an egotistical thing. I think it was just a case of... There was no conversation. There was no us two sitting down and saying, right, this is what we're going to do. We worked everything out on air, yeah? Yeah. And at the end of the day, you've got a vision of how you want to be. And I've got a vision of how you I want, want to be. be. And we were two different people. Yes, And yes, so... Yes. To make that work, at some point, there's got to be some kind of sit down where you have an understanding, you know? Um, and I think that for the first three months, it just wasn't there. Because I remember saying to Iver, the program controller, I said, King, I don't think I could do this, you know? <laughs> and Iver's response was, what? No, you're going to do this. You ain't got no choice. I put my neck on the line. You're going to do this. And um, we, we had a meeting. Patrick was in the meeting, Ivo was in the meeting, and I said, look, before anyone else laughs at us, let's laugh at ourselves. Let's call ourselves the two tons of fun. And from that moment... That was because you were both weighty, wasn't it? Big time. Big time. Yeah. Um, and we just went at it. We just went at it. And it became one of the most popular breakfast shows on the FM dial, especially within the black circuit of all the underground radio stations. At the days, them days, the stations were called Pirate. And then we decided we're not pirates, we're community radio stations because everybody started from there. Yeah. And your show was top end. Every underground radio DJ at the time would listen to the two tons of fun. How did that make you feel? I don't think I knew it. Sorry, I don't think I knew it at the time. Jeff is such a creative genius. Mm. And if you put the right person with him, then you've got gold. Yep. Um, and I think that's what Ivo, our programme controller, and Patrick, our managing director in particular, I think that's what they, they saw. They mm. recognised and they thought, you know what? You just got to leave these two boys and let them run with it. Some of it is going to be edgy, but we use that to our benefit. And so we became them two guys on the radio that would tackle any subject and would do it with a menace. And people loved it. Well, you did, because at the end of the day, there were certain parts of it which were a bit touching, touchy and they were very risky for radio beans that you was not a, a community radio station now. You were the black radio station called Choice FM. And of course, we're talking about people like Ofcom and stuff yeah. like that. So there was, was there any stages at all where you did get a little bit in problem with controversy and people like the management team coming in going, whoa, 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 whoa. 
anything like that happen? Not really. Um, I think some days Iva will be there in the studio watching us with that kind of frantic look on his face. <laughs> um, but there was never a case of, oh, we've had a complaint, or it never got to us. I think there were complaints that might have gone mm. to the radio station. But, you know, remember, Jeff and I, we weren't, we weren't that reckless. We were controlled reckless, mm. you know? You know what you do. Um, Jeff had already been teaching in colleges and that kind of thing. He wasn't a man that was going to recklessly just yeah. say, he knew what he could well, say, he teacher, knew what he really? could say. Yeah. And so <laughs> it, it wasn't a case of, oh, you've had this complaint or you've had that complaint. And I think at that time, creative radio was welcomed in a way that it's not anymore, not on, 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 on national radio stations. Um, and so you had different presenters from different radio stations trying all sorts of stuff. You know, Steve Jackson was doing his Steve thing. Steve was good. Though. Yeah, he was do you know good. what I mean? And it's, we were just the rough, raw version of what was going yeah. on on all the other stations. And, and, it, and it was loved. Well, it was definitely loved. Because on top of that, Martin didn't only just do his breakfast show. Martin also had his soccer career which obviously flew through the roof. He had a breakfast show that had thousands and thousands of uh, black, white, whatever color. Cause, Cause it was, even though it was a black station, you had a hell of a lot of different nationalities listening to your show as well, didn't you? Yeah, I, I, you know, I think Patrick Berry would always tell you it's not a black radio station. Yeah. From day one, he said that. Um, but we, we were a black music radio station. Yes. Um, our, our listenership was growing um, all the time. I think that we suffered from the systematic way in which radio is run, even to this mm. day. Um, but at the time, we were, we, we were building it and we built it with love. You know, every DJ that was on there, that's, you know, that you would say had been on there for a few years, Jigs, George K, Daddy Ernie, Kirk Anthony when he was alive. R.I.P. You know, Kirk. All, all, all of those people mm. were people where if we had a CD cabinet, it was built by one of us. Do you know what I mean? And it was put on the wall by one of us. It was that kind of love that built that radio station. Uh, and we were involved in, in, in so many things that helped to build Choice, which is why we felt it was like ours. ours. Choice. And Choice FM grew, grew, grew. It definitely grew. The buzz grew. You grew. And on your Soul Cut, they gave you another show because the Soul... Well, they didn't give you another show because you still had the Soul Cut show. You have never given it up and you were doing breakfast as well. Yeah, so... I took a lot out of you. Come on, Mike. Um, Yeah, the Soul Cut show was my number one show, hands down. Yeah, I started that show on the 30th of September 1990 at two minutes past eight. And that was the foundation of my career. So when I started the breakfast, they gave me the children's, they gave me the breakfast show, the weekend breakfast show on a Saturday morning in 92, which allowed George K and Daddy Ernie to do the morning zoo from nine till midday as opposed to six till nine. Yeah. Um, so I did the breakfast show, the early morning breakfast show. And then in 95, 96, everything started to change. Jeff came in to do the Saturday morning show. So he replaced George and Ernie. Uh, and then in 1997, July 97, was when Jeff and I started the breakfast show. So it was, it, I, don't, I wouldn't say it was tiring because I was in my mid twenties there. I was just enjoying the time. The time. Did you know it was going to come to an end, Martin? What was going to come to an end? Choice of them. Um, I, yeah, I think so. Um, Did you see flaws? There were no flaws. There were no flaws. The way that I try and explain this to people, right? You go out and you buy, there's a car that you want. There's a Maserati that you say, oh, I want that car. So you go to the owner and you say, I want that Maserati. And he says, for you to buy that Maserati, you've got to buy that BMW and you've got to buy that banged out Fiesta as well. We would have banged out Fiesta, mm -hmm. yeah? And so after Capital came in and bought us and they bought us with the intention of building us as an urban brand, as Choice FM, they then got into problems and they merged and they became GCAP Media. Yes. And then GCAP Media then sold the station to Global. Well, the moment they sold it to Global, Choice was never in his vision. 
Mm. Do you understand? And so he was always going to use it for something else, which is why so, Capital so came Let me out. ask you a question. What was the point of moving? Just, you know, uh, I've obviously got to play devil's applicate here. Yeah. Uh, what was the point of moving from Borough, where the rate was very cheap, to deciding to go up to the city in the heart of the West End, where the rates were enormous? Because we, by that time, the only reason we moved to Leicester Square is because we became part of Capital. And... You're no longer talking about a building. All Capital had to do was fund the studio. The rest of the building was already there. Mm. So it wasn't any addition to what they were paying already. So the move from Borough High Street to Leicester Square was purely because of the fact that Capital Radio had taken us over. Right. So if Martin, when Martin, what was the worst experience, Martin, when you went and put your fob on that door? As I do say to people and realise, and you're looking, you don't get up in the morning so early obviously you've got your other adventures but you don't get up in the morning to do that show the day that you weren't doing that show how did that feel um the day that i came off breakfast in 2011 was hard did you cry mate no but i'm going to tell you something when i came when choice finished in 2013 and the way that it finished you know you imagine that one minute we're being moved around the building because they're renovating the studio yeah and then as a presenter, you get into this new studio. This new studio looked like a spaceship. This is Capitol Building. Yeah, this is Capitol yes, Building, which yes. is global now. It's by Global, the, yeah. Global, yeah. And I've gone into this studio and I remember posting and going, my God, we've got a, finally got a decent studio. <laughs> Not knowing that in a few weeks, the button was going to be flipped and it was going to become Capital Extra. And I think that, for me, was the hurtful part. Not that we'd gone, but the way that we'd gone. And like, when you tried to Google Choice FM, Capital Extra came, came up, there was no history. no history. Like, if you try and search some of the great moments the that we had up. on radio, yeah, I'll find them. What was your worst experience at Choice? My worst experience? Hmm. I don't know if I had a worst experience. The worst interview I ever done was Pretty Ricky. I hated, <laughs> I hated that. <laughs> I, 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 I think there's certain things that I wasn't willing to negotiate. And, you know, this guy who had, I think it was five sons from five different women <laughs> and created this boy band. And wow. all this boy band did was talk about... Women's underneath. What girls come into the yeah, hotel. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the whole interview was like that. And they stunk to high heaven. And I'm like, there's no way me as a black man, I'm going to sit down on this radio station and hype you up. Mm. And so I said, oh, I'm done, I'm finished. And I stopped, asked, I stopped talking to them. And Lucy, <laughs> Lucy had to carry on this interview for as long as she could before she cut it short. Mm. And like, everyone was like, well, why did you stop talking to them? I said, listen, if it was down to me, I would have kicked them out 10 minutes ago. <laughs> you lot are playing nice with them. I'm, I, and I'm saying this knowing that their management team and their record label could hear this. I say, you cannot represent young black people like that. Come the man now. If you want to kick me off the radio, kick me off the radio. And I started to get that uptight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they thought, you know what? Just let him cool down. But the support I got from the listeners... They understood. ...made the radio station realise they've got to be careful about what they do and how yeah, they do it. Yeah, You know? And yeah. that's the problem I find with the urban scene now. Even when I do my breakfast show now, I'm playing music from 30 years ago because I'm comfortable with the lyrical content. Even if a new tune comes out now, I would never just play it because it comes from a reputable artist. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because you yeah, still yeah. don't know what they're going to be singing no, about. No, you, you don't, know? you don't. Um, and that, for me, is the difference between then and now. Um, the music scene now is it's really, changed. really difficult. They, people just sing foolishness. <laughs> But back in the day with the Choice Days, they were accepted. And they are, but nothing beats, and, and I was saying this the other day, it was the black stations that made a lot of these artists. Yeah. And a lot of these artists don't recognise that. They think it's the Capitals and all that, but they're not the ones that made the bad for them. With regards, with, to the, with regards to the American artists, Choice of him. The problem is the ra uh, record companies, mm. not the artists. And I'll tell you how I know this. Will Smith was coming to the studio for an interview. I had interviewed him once before, and they said, right, Will Smith's coming in to do the breakfast show with you and Asha. I said, all right, cool. Record company said, you're not allowed to look at him. 
<laughs> don't ask him for a photograph, nothing like that. I said, so what you're trying to say to me is, I must, look at, I must look at Asha and Asha must look at me, but we're talking to Will Smith. You don't think that's rude? So the record company's going, they're the rules, that's how we're doing it. I said, all right, cool. Will Smith comes in the studio. The first thing I said to He's him... He's not going to do that. I said, King, we've been told that we're not allowed to look at you, so I don't want you to think I'm being rude. <laughs> I might have went there. He put his arm on me. He goes, sometimes these record companies don't know what they're talking about. And he hugged me. He started to flirt with Asha. The conversation started. I said, well... Did it boycott on. you, though? Hmm? Did it boycott you from that label? No, no. They respected us. They respected us because sometimes you get people put in jobs and they're so worried about doing this job yeah. well that they do foolishness. Yeah, you yeah. understand? And so the fact that we were having a great interview, Will Smith flirting with Asha, I'm saying to him, well, how can you come in here and flirt with my co-presenter? Why didn't you bring Jada along so that me and I could have some com yeah, company? Yeah, yeah, and he yeah. goes, oh, if I'd known, I would have brought her along. And we were having that kind of laugh and they yeah, continued yeah. to flirt. Yeah. He showed me the hitch dance and all sorts. When we finished the interview, the record company said to me, um, oh, thank you very much indeed. I said, it's cool, man, but you don't need to calm down with your rules and regulations. <laughs> You're going to spoil the interview, I understand that you can't go silly, but you got to allow for some kind of interaction, the kind of like limitations that you're yeah, putting yeah, on yeah, it. Yeah. That could have that could have killed that interview. And I think the record companies just learn, you know, you got to have some trust in the, in in the people that are doing yeah. this stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, and all of that was a learning curve for me, you know, just watching how different companies behave, and the artists ain't got a clue what's going on. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. The, the artists that had a personal relationship with the radio station have always known. If you ask Usher, he'll never tell you anything other than his choice of him mm. because he was that close. Yeah, he used to be all the time, didn't he? R. Kelly, <laughs> although that name, you know, is a bit taboo now. Have you have you um, took him off of your playlist? I have. Do you believe everything that said that he did? He really did it all? I don't know if I believe that he did it all, but I think he did enough for it to warrant me to blacklist him. Yeah. Um, in a similar way that you and I have got to be wary of our reputation to a degree. Yes, yes. You know, I think that so is R. Kelly, you know. Um, and if you've got an amazing music career, you... You think you're untouchable, don't yeah. you? You, you, you shouldn't really be there shouldn't be that kind of evidence there against you talking about being untouchable in the beginning when you made the big, big break before we move on to what you're up to now and what's 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 occurring and things have definitely changed a lot but um did you when you first went on the choice you got the break and that did you think no one can touch me now i'm where i want to be no. or did you did you always keep to listen i'm just martin man always because some people they let it get to their head we weren't, Choice FM for us wasn't the be all and end all. Um, Choice FM was a little radio station that was aspiring to be this bigger radio station. And that's how we approached it. You know, the kind of money that Jeff and I were earning was not, no, we, we weren't earning no. What we earned in a year, some radio station presenters was getting that as expenses in a year. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and that's no exaggeration. It's the truth. Um, so we never felt like we were the be all and end all of anything because we weren't. We weren't, mm. you know, we were just an aspiring radio station that was growing and we were growing and growing and growing. And even with the changes that came afterward, um, I still felt like we were a growing brand. Mm. Um, so there was never that feeling for, me, for us. Do you miss it? If you'd asked me that in 2019, I would have said yes, with all my heart. When we go, when we start talking about what I'm doing now, I'll explain why that might have changed. Right. I'm missing it because obviously you're not you're not in the same place you are in a sense of on the radio, because radio has changed so much. And, and these days you would have mostly had to play a lot of, toilet as well because of how the music's gone and stuff the worst thing is when you're a presenter and being on the so-called legal side is when you're playing tracks that you actually don't like but you have to say you like it have you had experiences like that before well some of the stuff that i played on choice i wouldn't say i liked so <laughs> it, i think it's just that multiplied by 10 now yes, you know yes. um yeah there were some mornings that i sat down on breakfast and i went Whoa. I can't believe I'm playing this again. Um, 
but I was in the system at that time, you know? Um, and so I fully, I always say this when I'm doing interviews, I fully, fully understand how the youngsters feel today. And I will never tell a youngster, oh, that radio station you're on now, it's a load of rubbish. And I would never tell them that. They're living in the system that is there, that's been presented to them. So the youngsters that you're hearing on Capital Extra and that, they're doing their thing, you know mm. what I mean? And God bless them. And so dude, it's a new era, isn't it? Really? Yeah. It's nothing like our era. Even though us as older generation can turn around and say that, you know, the music from the 90s, I say it all the time, is the best time. Uh, this music is right now. I mean, gurgitated music, there's a lot of that yep. coming out. Chris is one prime example um, with Smile you know, and, and stuff like that. So when you hear these quality, like Shanice obviously done the original, when you hear these quality tunes come out and then you get this bubblegum music, does that frustrate you? It, it used to, but I'm happy that now I'm playing the original. Yes. On the, on the station that I'm on now, I'm playing the original, you know? Um, when I came off choice, I'm gonna give you this story as quickly as I can. When I came oh. off choice, um, I went into a depression, a deep, deep depression. Um, Why were you depressed? Because you wasn't doing the same thing that you're used to, getting up in the morning, going, doing the breakfast show, having thousands of people listening to you, going to the gigs, being the centre of attention, stuff like that. Was that the reason that put you in depression? Because you didn't do that the next day. Not the centre, I don't think being the centre of attention is what I want. This is my life. Mm. Doing radio was my life. And the moment that they got rid of choice, I was like... Before you get into that, do you blame Ivor or Patrick? For what? For getting rid of choice? No, no. I don't blame anybody. I fully understand how the transaction went. I understand. I understand what the directors... Forget Ivor. Ivor was a programme controller, yeah? Yes, yes. So Patrick, Neil and the rest of the directors, I understand why they felt the need to get some support. Because the advent of... DAB, which was what frightened everybody. Oh, massive, it is now. It was the cost of setting that up against the fact that national advertising agencies wouldn't spend money on choice because they didn't understand the brand. So are you saying, Martin J, you're putting it to bed to say that was because of the new generation of the technology Choice FM had to go under. It wasn't that Choice FM sold their soul because that is the rumour on the road uh, in a sense of it was a black people's radio station. Um, it's no longer here and people are very, very, still very bitter that we don't have our identity as a black radio station. Do you agree or you would say that that is the real reason because of the digital technology, which it's not for nothing. You you have to pay. To my belief, digital a month is eight grand. That's the higher it. Setting up of DAB radio, just the setting up alone, mm -hmm. you're talking about millions. And that is where... The money wasn't there. Yeah, that is where the, 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 the directors had to say, we don't think we can do this as the unit that we are. And if we're gonna do it, we're gonna need support. Gotcha. And that's when the conversation started happening with the bigger companies. I don't think if they had seen, if they were able to look down the line, say another seven or eight years and see how the monopolization of radio stations started to take over. They might have stayed there. They might have sort of another way of financing it. Right. But at that time, I don't think I don't think anybody involved in that transaction. <coughs> sorry, I don't think anybody involved in that transaction at the time was like, in seven years' time, this ain't going to be around. But being that you were so close to Patrick Neil um, and that wasn't, didn't you find it a little bit uh, worrying when you didn't even get the phone call to say we're going under, or you did? When you say we're going under, what do you mean? In other words, Choice FM I've got to close down. But Patrick wasn't part of the station at the time. Right. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. That's what I... The same analogy I gave you with the cars. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. You've bought your Maserati. You've come in. Yes. You've bought the Maserati. you bought the BMW. you bought out. you bought the banged out Fiesta. Yes. The owners of those have gone. Yeah, yeah. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. yeah, I still call Patrick Berry my managing director. But 
he had gone when we moved to Leicester Square. That was his involvement in the station. He had it's moved gone. on to other other projects. Um, and so when Choice became Capital Extra, it was a totally different body. Yeah, there was none of this. Choice Choice hasn't gone under. Choice just got eradicated. Mm. You know what I mean? It wasn't that we failed. There's a new brand, though, wasn't it? Yeah. Someone just said, actually, no, I don't want Choice of M to be any longer. I want to use this frequency and what we built up over 23 years. It was scrapped. Yeah. And I want to use it to help build capital. Mm. And that's what they did. They've got the money. Fair play to them. You but know? they were trying to obviously be a Choice of M, but with a bit of bubblegum. I don't even know if they were trying to do that. I don't even know if the people that own Global Radio have got any emotion whatsoever about Choice of M. Well, obviously, Choice of M was a situation you told us, um, and, and I interjected a little bit about depression hitting you, knowing that you weren't going to go in the next day and put the fob on the door and get in and go and do your show and everything. Did you sort of wake up the next day thinking it was a dream? No, I woke up the next day thinking this is a, this is it. I've got no transferable skills, or so I thought um, at the time. I don't know what I'm gonna do. I've done this for, I've done it for like the best part of 23 years. So this has been my life, mm. you know? What do I do now? And that for me was like. But you still had your soul cup. I still, as a, I had my brand as Martin J, yeah. Um, Cause you still had your club nights. Uh, Martin J, to my belief, does a lot of soccer events. Yep, I, yeah. And you're behind a lot of soccer events. That's what you're kept me... You're still behind the carnival. I'm not behind the carnival. I'm involved in the carnival. And they're basically taking that away from you as well. No, nah, they, they, they won't take that away. <laughs> they won't take, they won't take, that's, that's, that's a whole nother interview. They won't take that away. But yeah, I, I, I just felt that I didn't know what to do, you know? And I, I came home... I remember leaving Leicester Square the day that they told me, well, this is it. I left Leicester Square. I went to my mum's. I got on the Piccadilly line. I went straight to South Harrow and I met up with my son and my mum and I just felt numb. And I spent six or seven months unemployed, not knowing what to do. And I think the frustrating part was not knowing what to do. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I was getting an odd gig there and the odd gig here, but you know, it wasn't paying a mortgage. Yeah. yeah. Um, the support of my wife, especially, paramount at that point. Um, and then one day, a guy that used to work on choice, used to do the news, Beresford Matt, came to me and he said, Martin, there's a place in Tottenham. Come and, come and see the lady there. She knows how to get funding. Funding. I said, all right, cool. So he come up here, he picked me up. It was a Tuesday. Drove down the road, five minutes down the road, Tottenham High Road, went to this place called Haringey Main Cap. I started, um, it's a day centre for adults with learning difficulties. Yeah. I started volunteering there, doing nothing to do with radio whatsoever. And within two months, the chief exec said, how much is your mortgage? And I told her how much it is. She said, I'm going to give you a job. All it will do is pay your mortgage. You can't even go Sainsbury's and buy a sandwich afterwards. Wow, well, that's good though. That moment was a turning point of my life. A turning point in the sense that every day, to this day, I walk through that red door, that Harringay main cap, and I look at those people and I think, Martin, you have no right to feel cheated, disappointed, or let down. Yeah? You've got everything going for you. Do you reckon the Lord come to you? Are you a Christian? No, I wouldn't, uh, no, I, I don't think I'd, I'm a spiritual person. My mum's a very Christian person. I do believe someone up there Helps is looking out. after me. You is know it, what I mean? Has it made you a Christian person? Then? No, not really. And I, I know I, <laughs> I sound blunt when I'm saying it, no, but I, being I, real. I don't want to be hypocritical and tell you. 100%, yeah. Um, yes, I will use terms like God bless you, and but if you send me a scripture from the Bible, I won't read it. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, why would you call yourself a hypocrite? Because I'm, I'm yet to understand how you can believe that someone wrote that Bible. Mm. How did they do that? You mm. understand me? Yeah. Um, yeah. And how can you believe that it's so accurate? You know what I mean? Um, and so I believe someone up there is helping me. And I very much believe that what you put out, in fact, if you go to my Instagram page today, my post says what, what you put out will come back to you. It will just come from a different source. And so sometimes you may give 
the person that's walking on the left hand side of the road a 10 pound but the person on the right hand side of the road is the person that's going to give you 40 pound mm. you know you don't to, i don't think you should give and look to that person to receive it will come back somewhere else and so my life just started to get better bit by bit working at Harringay Mencap um I then you still there today still there today brilliant by working for Harringay Mencap I then started to work for a company called Naburu London and again I work with adults with learning disabilities and people that have autism yeah and that for me was when I was told we've been given money by the National Lottery and we want you to teach these people how to do a podcast. Wow. I went, what? Which is obviously back to your roots of radio. It's the start of radio again. And that, for the last three and a half years, has been my joy. Being able to meet up with people, even doing it online as well. Um, and just make them feel better about themselves by presenting. We talk about anything, you know. They, they, the topics are not deep, you know, but... Martin, there's something I want to ask you. We're talking about new technology, because uh, I do know that, talking about that, radio is still very close to you, mm -hmm. because your brother Vinny and yourself have put together your own radio station that you have, and you're obviously a breakfast presenter and stuff like that. Do you feel to yourself that online radio is the way forward now? Yep. Yep, most definitely. Um, Vinny put back on our radio together when I was on Choice, yeah? And so in the early years, I didn't have anything to do with it other than, like, helping him out with a name, mm. giving him a few pointers. He did that by himself. Uh, when I came off Choice, and then I went on to back on our radio, I was there, and it was it was like... It was hard for me because I was so used to going on choice and then instantly you're getting text messages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. The, the, the response was much different. Yeah. And there was I sitting down in my front room <laughs> with this controller and I'm talking into the microphone and I'm going, is anyone out there? <laughs> in 2015, I had a pulmonary embolism um, and I was off air for a few weeks. Oh, sorry, bro. And... I, th at that point, I was like, do I really want to go back on there? I went to Shepherd's Bush Market and this old lady tapped me on my arm and I was like, yes, ma'am. She said, when are you going back on the radio? <laughs> I said, um, and I didn't know what to say to her. She said, my son taught me how to listen to your show. Wow. And I never miss it. Wow. When you're on air, that's my, that Sunday is my enjoyment. Wow. That was the, that was the Saturday. The Saturday evening, I put a post up on Instagram to say I'm back on the radio. Wow. And I just had that mindset from that day. Don't worry about who you think's listening. Just do that show to the best of your ability. And I kept on doing that, kept on doing that. I never really studied the response. Every now and then I'd get a message saying, I love listening to your show and that. So I knew that people were still out there. When the pandemic started, I was in Orlando. So I came back, I was flying back the Wednesday night, Thursday morning. The Friday was when we went into lockdown. Um, I just said, you know what? These people are going to be at home. Let me, let me do a breakfast show. And I went on there and I said, I'm going to do this pop-up breakfast show on a Friday morning. People listened in, they tuned in, they said it's fun. I said, all right, we'll do it for one more week. That time there, I didn't know what was going on with work. And ladies and gentlemen, don't forget, this is online radio. Online radio. So when people are talking about the FM is here, ah, oh, I don't listen to online Martin, who is one of the legends in the music business, is telling you about online radio from when he started to now where he is now. Yeah. Oh, man. So the following week, I've done this pop-up breakfast show. And the feedback that we were getting, my brother called me. He goes, bruv, 
the amount of phone calls I've had about people saying this is like listening to Choice of Fem back in the day and rip, rip, rip. That time there, my boss calls me and goes, right, you're furloughed. I'll see you sometime in the summer. I'm like, so you're telling me I'm not coming into work? She goes, yep, that's right. But I'm still getting paid. She goes, yep, that's right, we'll pay you a certain percentage of your money. Put that on the phone. <laughs> I, 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 the same advert that I had with the pop-up breakfast show, I just took out pop-up. And I said, this is here until my boss says we're going back to work. Back to work yeah. Now, at the same time, I was working for Nabooru, but I was able to do that online. And so I still had sources of income. And that period, March 2020, to this day, had been my most enjoyable time on radio. I don't differentiate from FM to online. You know? You just got to do online properly. Radio is radio, mm. you know what I mean? Mm. I don't like it when I crash vocals, you know? I'm not going to play you songs that have got profanity in it. I, the same guidelines that I had when I was on Choice, Choice, the same guidelines I use upstairs in my little studio, mm. you know? Today... But there must be a blessed mark to get up, walk in that room, away from all the family, close that door. If you have to bolt it, bolt it, have your time, Come back sat downstairs and present. Yeah. Must be a place. It's, 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 I've never been as happy radio wise as I have been recently. And I've told my listeners that they know. This morning I did a, a, a topic where I wasn't even sure how it was going to go, but I said, let me try it. I, put, I normally put the topic up on Facebook the night before just to get a few comments going. I said, your partner, ladies, your partner gives you £75 to buy underwear. Where are you shopping? And this thing went all over the place. I'm well, it's not going to be Ann Summers. <laughs> well, the thing is, is that half Prime Marley, <laughs> half the women are saying Prime Marley. Um, but they're not going to tell you that. Well, they're saying seventy-five pounds not enough. I'm like, what? <laughs> they're saying yeah, seventy-five pounds not, not enough. So you know, the whole thing started to unfold, and I'm saying, listen, I didn't tell you that your, your partner's giving you £75 to go and buy underwear for one night of explosive passion. I never told you that. I just asked you, he gave you £75, where would you go shopping? And then I said, I'm going to ask my wife and see what she says. So I knew that Pauline would be asleep and so that there'd be a wait for her to answer the answer question. Answer the question, yeah. Just those kind of things are things that make radio that's what make that's what gives us our buzz gives yes, us you know yes. that feedback it makes a show go like yeah, that 100% and and so to the people out there that listen to us on online radio and I'm talking about all of us um your feedback to us is what that's the petrol mm. that keeps the, the keeps engine going. moving yeah. moving you know um yeah, yeah. And so if any shape, in any shape or form, if you can send your, your, the, the person that you're listening to on the radio, just a message to say, I'm enjoying the show. Even that alone mm. is enough to keep us going. Keep and I get going. enough of that for me to say, it's worth it. I'm good where I am. Now, Martin, I have a part in the show because, you know, you tell us your goods and they're also bads and there's different uglies. So I'm switching it around and asking for those three subjects. And I'm going to start off with, within radio, within your career as being the Soka Prince and everything like that, what has been the best days of your music career? Whew. There's too many. Every day I go on the radio is the best day. Every, every day I go on the radio is the best day. I could, yeah. That, that's, that's the only answer I could So it's your best days on radio Whatever format, whatever platform Is doing a radio show Yeah That's what makes me happy And like, you know One day the Amazon guy came to the door Knocked the door Gave me this box And had a bottle of Eldorado rum in it Yeah, I'm a rum drinker yeah. I couldn't work out who sent it for about half an hour When I worked out who sent it I'm like, it's not my birthday. He said, Martin, you got me and my family through 2020. Just tuning into you with in the, the morning lockdown. kept yeah. us safe. 
That's you a can't good get a better award no. than that. You no. can't. No, you Do you understand? Um, and so, just being on the radio, they're like my best moments. Okay, well, that's Martin's good ones. But of course, with the good, you have the bad, which is your bad one. The worst moments of radio? Of your life. Of your career. Martin J. That brand name. Because your, your government name is not Martin J, is it? No, nah, my, my, my government name is Martin Abraham. Long time ago, I would have never told you that, you know? It, that, yeah. That's how we were back in the day. Yeah. Um, Where did the name come from? Martin J came from... Remember when I was telling you I was selling all those demo tapes to Patrick yes. Berry? Yes, yes. At the time, me and my girlfriend, Martin and Jeanette, had this promotion company, Martin J Entertainment. You've said it already, Martin and Jeanette. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And... That's where the Jay, history. It's just Patrick Berry saw the Martin J Entertainments. I said, can I speak to Martin J? <laughs> I hadn't created the name yet. I was still Crazy MD. Mad, mad. So um, on top of that now, you're talking about your bad experiences. I think I've spent money foolishly over the years. Wasted money. Yeah. I've, I've, on, what, on what what type of things did you waste it on? Oh. I'm not going to say drink and drugs. No. (laughs) I think when you sit down in the position that you're in now in 2021 and you think to yourself, in 2004, I'll give you as an example, I earn over 130 grand. Through entertainment. Through everything I was doing at the yeah, time. Yeah. Where it there? You understand? To the point Is where... Is it because you took it for granted? Yeah, you It's do. coming back again. You do. You didn't have it this week. But you got, I could spend it this week. This one I will spend this week. Next week, it comes back to me again. Yeah. Is that how you felt, Mike? And you just take it for granted. For granted. So to the young people, especially in this day and age... Tomorrow's not guaranteed to everybody. Just be a little bit smarter with your money. Mm. I'm not telling you don't enjoy it. Yeah. Because you can't go six feet under with it. But just be a little Spend bit smarter. Spend it wisely. If I had been a little bit smart, I would have paid off my house by now. Right. You know? Um, but you tell the truth, Mark. You're not egotistical. I think you've got to be... I mean, I've known you for a little while, but you've never been egotistical. I think you've got to tell the truth. I think if you want... If you've got a love and a passion for the younger generation... I'm a, I'm a granddad now. What's those I mean? answers? Youngsters. Madness right now. On the street. Causing mayhem amongst themselves. Not recognising if they're brothers or sisters. Not recognising if they're related somewhere. How does that make you feel, Mark? It makes you feel horrible. But Could we have done more? As a people? Can we... Um, I don't know if we could have done more... I would like to think that we could have done more, but I don't know what that more is or was. Mm. And I don't know whether, regardless of what we would have done, whether the government and the society would have... Allowed us to. You understand? Um, Is youth clubs the answer? Everyone says it is. Well, you see, I, I don't think it's as simple as that. I don't think that it's a... It can't be that, you know, the dif- the difference between the youth of the 1980s and the youth of the 2000s is the fact that there's no youth clubs around. But mm. the way that we were taught in school, the the system generally for young people was different back in the day. Um, the discipline that was instilled into people back in the day was different, you know. When you go to schools now and you hear children talking to their teachers and... No respect. None whatsoever. But that comes from home, Martin, doesn't And it? the parents... There you go. ...would then come into the school and go, you can't talk to my child like that, you know, me, I'm going to slap you up. Mm. They're not earning any more than the teachers were back mm. in the day. Why, mm. why, you know, you, you're just going to let them get on with it. 100%. 100%. You know? 100%. So, there has to be... We have to do some deep thinking for ourselves and work out, well, how can we stop the rot 
from our homes mm. coming out. Um, and it must start at home. There's the good, there's the bad, there's also an ugly. Is there yeah. an ugly or is the bad the ugly? Sometimes the good is ugly, man. Sometimes, sometimes it's got to get ugly. You know what I mean? Mm. It's just how it is. Mm. Okay, Martin, on top of that, this is going to be a funny one because I also go for a situation. I want you to name me your five biggest sound systems. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> and DJs. Can be DJ as well. Look, no, yeah, five DJs, five sound systems. Okay, so from a sound system perspective, I'm going to start locally and I'm going to move my way out. So the first sound system that was a big influence on me was a sound system called Playboy Sounds Incorporated. And they're from West London. And that was the Henry Brothers. Um, they were the sound system that I went to listen to week in, week out. Was Travis a part of that? Hmm? Mike Travis, was he a part of that? Light skin guy, really tall? No? Anyway, no. carry on. Go on. Moving a little bit further out, special edition from Labour Grove. Mm -hmm. um, massive influence on my life in terms of listening to how they played, and they played different to the other sound systems. Diamonds, a girl's best friend. Free. Was a massive, massive influence for me. In, they taught me how to play to an older generation. Generation, yeah. yeah? Um, I, you, I, for me, Saxon was Four. a massive... They were the superstars of it, you know? Yes, yes, yes. Um, when you can name all the MCs, um, then you know just how they promoted themselves. You looked up to that. Um, the fifth sound system, I think, has got to be Rap Attack. Okay. Alistair was holding it down in West London. And again, he was doing it slightly differently. A lot of these sound systems, they all, every single one that I've mentioned so far, done it a little bit differently if you went to any one of their dances the music would be different um and i just learned from all of them do you think there's a bit of same old same old with the djs and everything these days with what's going on when i look at the younger djs i am a little bit disappointed in the fact that i don't think they'll ever fully grasp the value of music Okay. Because okay. they, you know, if you talk to a, and again, this is not their fault. If you talk to a 21 year old that's DJing now, it's got all the tunes under the sun. Mm. Where'd you get it from? I got online. Online, online yeah. And so mm. that commitment of going. Hunting around and getting that gold dust. You know what I mean? Yeah, like what we used to do. That commitment of. How about controllers? Controllers, Techniques 12s. Are you are you a controller, Martin? Yeah, I'm a controller. I'm a controller purely because it makes sense. Okay. You know? Um, okay. For carrying wise. Yeah. I <laughs> I remember the days of carrying crates of records up three flights of stairs. <laughs> you know, and so I welcome I welcome the ease of walking with my laptop and a hard drive. Um, but I'm fortunate enough to know that Prince Alan's Bucket Bottom, I remember going and searching all kind of record shop for that seven inch mm. and going to the main ones. You were never going to find it. You know, oh. you go to Dubrinda, you're never going to find it. You go to Hawkeye, you ain't going to find it. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. you got to go into one of them little, little record shops. Yeah, 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 Say, yeah. excuse me, have you got the seven inch of Prince Alice Bucket Bottom and they go yeah man come true and whilst you're there you're so happy you say well, we'll buy a few more tune them you know what I mean yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's how you begin another relationship with another record shop um, you respect the music a little bit more when yeah, you do yeah, that yeah, yeah. but like I said it's, it's you've got to move with the times us as the older DJs 
We should be influencing more. And we've got to move with the times as well. Is your kids into the music at all? My son is a very, very technological person, yeah. uh, but he's not a DJ. He's a singer. Yeah. He's a videographer. He's a photographer. Um, but yeah, the, the DJing thing has is, is evaded him. Okay. So tell us about your five MCs, Mark. MCs? Yes. Oh, I don't even know if I've got five. Sound MCs? <laughs> yeah. Sound or DJs? Right. Um, DJs. But don't forget, that's MCs. Yeah, you see? You're talking, you're talking MCs like God's an MC. Hollywood's an MC. I'm talking MCs. Yeah, I wouldn't have a top five. You're not going to have a top five? I te- no. Why is that, Martin? Because I come from an era where you did everything. Do you understand? One man band. And not necessarily a one man band, just an all rounder. I got you. You know what I mean? And you'd be an all rounder in a team. So you could do everything, but you could also go to the bar for 20 minutes knowing that your brethren can do everything as well. <laughs> you know, it wasn't a case of one man play next man mic although yeah i wouldn't be able to give you a top five because i haven't studied that element of the sound system for so you. long i see you well Mar- martin J, um i would like to ask you for i know you're a very busy man and i appreciate so much for you giving me your life story but martin could you let us know really quickly what are you up to now and, and what's the events i know you and your brother's got your station going and stuff like that. So uh, tell us what's what's happening now with you. Right, I'm on Back on Our Radio. Mm. Uh, you can get us on backonourradio.co.uk. I do a breakfast show on a Monday and a Thursday. I do the soca show on a Sunday. I also do a drive time jam on a Friday where I talk to the artists from the Caribbean. Um, I run the station, and so I, I try and help a lot of the DJs that are on there. Um, and so that is one of my main focuses in in this day and age. That's what I do. Back on our radio, um, and like I've already said, I work for Harringay Main Cap during the week, and I work for a company called Nabooru London. So if I'm not working for Back on our radio, I'm helping adults with learning disabilities or people with autism. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. most importantly, I'm enjoying it. Brilliant. Well, do you know what, Martin? I'm, I'll be honest. I interview a lot of people and I really never knew you were going to let off so much to me and I appreciate it. So I'd like to say, Martin J, we don't just come. You know when you go to your mum's house mm-hmm. or you go to someone's house, they always say, Peter Terry, you never go to the home empty-handed. So we would like to say, Martin J, oh if we'd just God. like to open this and we'd like to say, this has been all about your life wow mr martin j as he opens it Whoa. there you go sir can you read out what it says on this i say the industry street presents to martin j for your contribution to the music industry there you go martin this is going in my studio this is lovely <laughs> <laughs> ladies and gentlemen that's martin j absolutely amazing guy and you know he told you the goods, the bads and the uglies. He told you about situations of being depressed over a situation. It just shows that if you think about it and you have to sit back and reflect, every day as people say to me, you know, is not guaranteed to you. The next day is not guaranteed to you. But we're going to have another big interview next week on the industry street. So from Martin J, Peter Terry, till next time, keep the streets clean. Bye-bye.